Marriage is a miracle. It's a miracle that God brings two people together. And make no mistake, God brings you together. When you, when you come before him and you say those vows, God has brought you together. And he doesn't make any mistakes. There are no accidents. He, he, and he is doing everything in his power to make sure that he works through you to be a witness to this world. So for all the marriages out there, God loves you. He is for you. And he is there to strengthen you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, y'all, we are going to get into the word. Are you guys loving the word? I don't mean like me teaching. I mean, that's whatever. But I mean, when you, can, when you can read the word for yourself and get in there and hear what God is saying for yourself, that's the most powerful thing in the world. Because when somebody tells you something, that's one thing. But when you're reading and God tells you, forget about it. No one can take that away. No, I heard God, and he spoke straight to my heart, and it says it right here. This is what I'm standing on. And then faith grows. When we, when we get in the word for ourselves, real faith begins to develop. So I'm encouraging you all, make sure you're in the word. We have the, the reading plans in the back. Uh, it has the first quarter of the year, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, so you can be on track to read the Bible through. We are reading the entire Bible through it this year. So we are halfway done. How many of y'all are halfway through reading the Bible? How many of y'all are on the extended plan where you go just a little bit longer. Hey, that's all right. It's just a goal. It's not that you have to. There is nothing in this Bible that says you have to read this through every year. It's just a goal. But as long as you are in the word every day, you're, you're getting that word in there, that's all that matters. So make sure that you're, you're getting in there. But for those of you who are on, on track, way to go, way to keep that discipline, let's just keep going. Now, you can still read the Bible through in six months. You just got to read about 6.4 chapters a day, and it's not that bad. So get back on track. You guys can get those things in the back. It's important to be in the word. You know, God's desire for us is that we would mature to the fullness of Christ. So what that means is, like he spoke in Jeremiah, that one day he desires that there be no need for teachers because his law would be written on your heart. And you would just know because you've spent time with him, because you've fellowship with him in prayer and with the brother, you just know him. And there's going to come a day where that happens. But right now, there are teachers and preachers and pastors who are, who are there to encourage you in the word. So everything that you get here, it is, it is not your food for the week. This is the aroma of what's cooking in your spirit that God wants to impart to you himself. So this is the aroma. This is, there's something cooking in there, and I got to go get that, and I got to feed myself. So all throughout the week, the, the, the plan is that every day you're eating the word. You're fellowshipping. You're drinking his spirit through prayer. So every day, reading the word, every day in prayer. Every day reading the word, every day in prayer. Make it a part of your life. Don't just let Sunday be like your big, huge meal. That is not going to do it. None of y'all would do that with food. Well, I'm just going to eat one big, huge smorgasbord. It's going to take me four hours to get it down. And then I'm going to go the rest of the week and just tough it out. That's not designed. In church, the, the, the assembly is not designed for that. It's designed to come together and to fellowship and to, for iron to sharpen iron. It's kind of like a, you know, we all have flesh, right? Raise your hand if you're in here. You still got flesh. Now raise your hand if you're lying. Pretend like you don't. You all got flesh, and it's still there. And our flesh is, you know, I, I've got to cut my boy's hair. My boy's hair grows so fast. They're like Absalom. And Absalom was a dude in the Bible. His hair grew fast. So their hair grows so fast. As soon as I cut it, I turn around. And I'm like, dang, you need another haircut. And, you know, I was sitting in there cutting their hair, and they can't stand it when I cut their hair. I don't know why. I don't pull on it or anything. They just don't like sitting there waiting for me to cut their hair and fade it up and everything. And I was like, you know what? This is kind of like church. We come together every once in a while, and our flesh is always trying to grow back. It is always trying to get the upper hand on us. It is always trying to show its ugly face again. But we got to come together. we got to get in the Word. we got to be around people who can tell us, oh, you're looking a little nappy. You need a little trim up on the side. You need a little something over here. And we got our brothers and sisters that will tell us and be like, hey, you know what I'm noticing? That you're right. I haven't been in Word. I haven't been in prayer. So we have, we have this. So we gotta get those, we got to get those haircuts every once in a while to make sure we're all lined up and, and looking good. That's what the Word does. That's what fellowship does. So you guys, make sure that you're, you're always in the Word, you're always in prayer, and that we're coming to church to get those haircuts because it's getting a little scraggly. Glory to God. Well, we have been going through the Word 
ever so slowly. And we are in the, the book of Genesis. And we are in chapter 30. We went to uh, 29 uh, and 30 last week. And uh, let's just flip there now. Genesis 29 and 30. Do a quick, quick recap. While you're turning there, I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being here in this place today. We know you were here with us, Lord God. You said wherever two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst. So we thank you for being here. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is resting in this place. Father, we just ask that you would help us to open up our hearts and our minds to hear everything that you have for us today. We want to hear from you today. So, Lord, I pray that you would guard my mouth and that you would only let those things that are true proceed, Lord. Let not one false word come out of my lips here today. We did not hear, come here to hear man. We came to hear from you, Lord God. Open up your word to us, Lord God, and grant us your Holy Spirit, our counselor, to lead us and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So last week, uh, we were in Genesis 29 and 30, and we're looking at the life of Jacob. Man, and he, so far in the Bible, he's, he's like up there with the, the, the bad guys and the screw-ups. I mean, his whole life up until this point is based on lies and deception. So he, he stole his brother's uh, birthright. Then he stole his blessing by pretending he was him. Then he, he runs away so he doesn't get killed. And he comes into his, uh, his mother's brother's house and starts bossing people around. And he starts manipulating and controlling the situation. And we, and we saw how manipulation and control creeps into people's lives when there's no trust in God. God had given him revelation. Remember, he laid his head on the rock, and God showed him who he was. He saw the angels ascending and descending on a ladder. God gave him a revelation, and at the top of it, God showed himself to him. And he said, now I'm going to be your God. And he said, yes, you will be my God, and I will serve you. But there's still a process. Now, if, most of us are like, okay, if you just saw God, you would think that everything would have just been burned out of you. It's like all wrong is just gone. But... After his revelation, he still had some stuff to work on. Matter of fact, the Lord took 20 years to work on that stuff in him. And we saw that he, he still lacked trust. When we lack trust, we begin to try and manipulate and control situations. And we use uh, three tactics uh, that we talked about. We, we talked about intimidation, seduction, and lies that we use to try and manipulate and control the situation. And it's not always because you're, you're, there's malice intent. Sometimes it's just because you're not, you don't feel safe. So if you don't feel safe, you've got to create safety by trying to do it all yourself, right? So you, you, some people try and intimidate. Some people are very seductive, like, oh, they have a flattering tongue, or they try and, you know, maneuver real sly and real subtly. And then some people just flat out lie. I mean, if you think about it, why does anybody lie? Why would you not tell the truth? Because there's something in it for you. You're trying to gain an advantage by not disclosing the truth or by saying something that's just completely off altogether. So it's all a part of manipulation. And manipulation, the foundation of that is fear. And the foundation of fear is a lack of trust in God. So we talked about making sure that we're growing in our trust of him, that we can trust him with our very lives. We can trust him with our families. We can trust him with our finances. We can trust him with our health. There is nothing that we cannot trust the Lord with. We looked at Proverbs 3. It says, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding acknowledge him in all your ways, all of them, not just some of them, all your ways, and he will direct your path. So we have to learn to trust God. So Jacob is going through this process of learning to trust God, and he's learning to trust God through, really, somebody give him a taste of his own medicine. He, he, you know, Jacob thinks he's a deceiver, and then he steps into Laban's household, and he's like the king of manipulators. You know, they've got this whole family of manipulators that, that's going on here. And so he comes into Laban's territory. He serves seven years for Rachel. So he thinks. So he serves seven years. And at the end of seven years, Jacob is like, give me my wife. He's like, sure, sure, let's have a big party. And then gets him drunk. And then when it's the pitchest, darkest part of the night, sends his daughter Leah into him. And then Jacob wakes up in the morning. He's like, what have you done? He didn't even know who it was. And then Laban goes, oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to tell you. In this country, the older has to marry first, and then the younger can marry. It would have been nice if you would have informed me that seven years ago when I first made the deal. But no, he didn't tell him. He was controlling the situation. So he says, no, I'm going to give you Rachel. You know, just be with Leah for a week, and then 
I'll give you Rachel if you serve me another seven years. Man, just whoop, got the rug pulled out from underneath him. But Jacob did it. He served him another seven years. Fourteen years he served so that he could have his wife. So now let's pick up in uh, the end of chapter 30, around verse 25. 25. So leading up to this, we saw this, we saw this whole drama of Rachel and Leah competing for Jacob's affection. Again, manipulating and controlling, trying to see who can have the most children. And if one of them, you know, didn't have children, they would give him his maid. So now he's basically got four wives and, you know, 11 children with these, with these four different women because they're going back. I mean, even to the point where Leah buys a knight with Jacob for some mandrakes, you know, for some food. So just like trading their husband around, all kind of crazy drama going on. There's nothing on, t- on TV like this. So now at the end of it, Rachel's just had Joseph. Verse 25, and it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go for you know my service which I have done for you. So he's saying, hey, look, I fulfilled my commitment. I served you 14 years, even though you tricked me and you lied. I served you 14 years. Now, let me have my children and my wives, so I can go back to my country. And Laban said to him, please stay if I have found favor in your eyes. Here comes that manipulation again, that seduction. If I've been good to you, haven't I been a great father-in-law? Look at all these children and my daughters that I've given you. Isn't this been great? If I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. You can't go. You have God's blessing. And if you leave, the blessing leaves. So I got to try and hold on to this. If you have any favor for me, stay. Then he said, name your wages and I will give it. So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what you had before I came was little and has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now, when shall I I also provide for my house? He's like, look, I've served you this entire time and everything has just been for you. Everything I did was for you. I asked nothing. I have, uh, except your daughters. I have your daughters that are my family. I've taken nothing from you. He's like, when can I go and provide for my family? So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. So he says, let me just go through and let me take all the unwanted Let me take all the speckled, the streaked, the browned, the spotted, all these things that you don't want. Because back then, great value was placed on lambs without spot or blemish. The streaked and speckled ones, those were considered less than. So he says, let me have the least of all your flock, and these will be my wages. Look at Laban's response. Well, first, uh, Jacob says, so my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. So in other words, let's separate the spotted and the speckled, all the less than, and I'll take those for my wages. And that way, if there's any dispute in the future, because Jacob knows there's going to be one, we'll be able to say, I took nothing from you because everything that I have will be spotted and speckled and brown and gray, and all of yours will be without spot or blemish. So that way, there's no dispute. It says, everyone that is not uh, speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. And Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word, exclamation point. He's excited about this. Remember, part of that manipulation and control is to always try to have the upper hand and have an advantage over the other person. Jacob's, uh, Jacob's saying, hey, I'll take all the ones that you don't want, all the ones that are considered less than. And Laban's like, that's it? 
perfect. That is exactly what I wanted too. I'll get all the good stuff and you get all the leftovers, even Stephen, everything's great. He's like, oh, that it would be according to your word. Poor Laban, he didn't know what was up. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, everyone that had some white in it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hands of his sons, Jacob did. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Now, Jacob took for himself rods, listen to this. Before we get into this, remember, everything that is written in scripture is prophesying and speaking about Jesus and what he's going to do for us. Everything points to that. God has layers and layers and layers of mysteries and messages wrapped up in the word for us to discover, and it's kind of fun. You go in there and you're like, why did he do this this way? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a couple things here today. But just remember, everything points to Jesus and what he's going to do for us. Everything. Verse 37. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them and exposed them in the rods. And the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters, otherwise in in the, the water troughs where they would drink. In the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink. And like, okay, so he cut some strips and some branches, puts them in the watering troughs so that they would conceive when they came to drink. So it's some method that he's using to try and bring uh, conception to the flock. So the flocks conceived before the rods, looking at the rods, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. So Jacob finds a way, or hears a way, rather, we'll see in in, in chapter 31. He hears from God on a way to get the sheep to bring forth speckled, spotted, and blemished offspring. Isn't that interesting? He's like, yeah, I'll just take all the ones that you don't want. And then all the ones that are birthed will be speckled, streaked, and spotted. He had a plan going in. Now, let me preface this. This was God's design. This wasn't Jacob just coming up with this on his own. I mean, who would think of that anyway? I'm going to take some twigs, carve a little something in them, and throw them in some water, and it's going to make all the sheep and all the goats, uh, you know, have speckled children. You know, who, who, thought, who thought of that? It was the Lord that told him to do this. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flocks. So he's separating everything. So every time they give birth to a speckled or streaked uh, goat or sheep, he pulls them away, puts them with his, and then separates Laban's back to him. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in, so the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. So he's like, okay, we have some weak sheep and goats that are about to conceive. I don't want them. He doesn't put the poplar, the almond, and the chestnut in front of them so they conceive. So Laban's sheep are all weak. But when the strong ones come, he's like, oh, those are the ones. He puts the poplar, the almond, and the chestnut in front of them, and they conceive and bring forth spotted and speckled. So now all of Jacob's flocks are strong and healthy, even though they're spotted and speckled and streaked. And then all Laban's, even though they are without blemish, they are weak. So Laban's got all these weak sheep over here that look great. They look wonderful. They look like they got it all together over here. And then Jacob has these ugly, streaked, spotted, speckled, browned, grayed, less than sheep over here, but they're strong and they're healthy and they're producing. They're producing strong. And that's something. Why did God allow this? What is he teaching us through this? Verse 43. 
It says, thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants and camels and donkeys. So here comes Laban, and he's trying to manipulate and control and thinks that he is pushing Jacob down beneath him and still controlling him. And here is Jacob under the, the direction of God, and he is being strengthened, and he is prospering and becoming exceedingly prosperous, and Laban is becoming weaker and weaker. Everything points to Christ in what he's doing. Everything. Everything. The Bible is full of symbolism, and the Lord does it on purpose. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me lay you a, a little foundation here before we get into all of what this means. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a picture of the Trinity. This is a picture of the Trinity. We have Abraham. He is the father of the faith. He represents the father, the originator of all life. Then we have Isaac. Who was Isaac? His only begotten. His only begotten son was Isaac. He was born of faith. Now, the Bible says that he was the only begotten. But we also know that Abraham had another son before Isaac, right? What was his name? Ishmael. Ishmael was born, but he was born not according to the promise, but according to what? The flesh. He was born according to the flesh. So Ishmael, though he was born first, he was born according to man's attempts to bring God's will on the earth. That was, that was a result of disobedience and manipulation and control. And Ishmael was born. But Isaac was his only begotten son. He was born according to the promise, according to faith. And remember when Abraham, the father, took Isaac up on the mountain and laid him on the altar, ready to be sacrificed, to lay down his only begotten son. But then the angel of the Lord cried out and said, don't do it. You don't have to. I just wanted to see if, if you would be willing. Now that I see that you would hold nothing back from me, even your only begotten, now I won't hold back from you. And our father, he followed through. He took his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ, and he allowed him to go up the hill of Golgotha and be sacrificed for our sin. Isaac represents Christ. So then, who is Jacob? Jacob is representative of the Holy Spirit. We have the Father, the Source, Isaac, the only begotten Son, and then Jacob, the Holy Spirit. What did the Holy Spirit do? When Jesus left, he said, I go away that the promise may come. What was the purpose of the Holy Spirit? The purpose of the Holy Spirit was to come and live and dwell inside of us. So now there is not one who is begotten, but many. The Holy Spirit represents God's multiplication in his people. Just like Jacob multiplied. Abraham, he had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons. And from them, all the tribes of Israel came. So that rep he is representative of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was imparted to us, and now there is a family. There is a family who have Christ inside of them. No longer just one but many. So Jacob represents the multiplication. So God, is, God has this symbolism all throughout, and he's telling us what he's doing. So let's look, at, let's look at what just happened with all these sheep. Back at verse 37. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar, of the almond, and chestnut trees. Poplar, almond, and chestnut. Three different trees. God doesn't put anything in his word on accident. He does it on purpose. And everything is a reflection of who he is. Poplar trees. These trees are known for their great covering and the shade that they provide. They are a covering. The almond tree, it, the almond represents God's word. Remember in Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12, he said, he said to Jeremiah, he said, what do you see? And he said, I see an almond branch. He said, and then the Lord said to him, you have spoken rightly, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. The almond represents the word of God. In the Old Testament, when they, when they built the tabernacle, they made the lampstands or the menorah, 
and the top of each one was an almond blossom. And that is where they put the candle and the flame. It, it was representative of God's word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The almond represents his word. And then there's the chestnut tree. The chestnut tree was tall and strong, and it represented power and strength. So he sets before them the covering, the word, and the power. He sets before them the Father, the Son, because Jesus is the word, and the Holy Spirit, which brings power. He sets before them a picture of God. And this picture of God produces strength. What is he talking about here? What is he showing us in this instance? He's showing us his plan. He's showing us his plan for you and I. Those who are spotted, those who are streaked, those who are less than perfect, those who are Gentiles, who should never be a part of the family, those who are supposed to be rejected, those who have imperfections. He said, these are the ones that I'm going to use. These are the ones that I'm going to strengthen. You see, when, when, the, when God was presented to those without spot or blemish, that is representative of the children of Israel. To the Jews first, and then to the Gentiles. But the stone that the builders rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. He was rejected by his own. But through the Jews, we receive our inheritance. Just like those blemish-free lambs, they saw the word of God. They did not perceive it. But through them were birthed the spotted and the speckled. And now here we are. Through the Holy Spirit, Jacob, the representative, we have increased and gained strength. God is showing us his grace and his mercy for those who are less than perfect. That he is going to impart his strength to those who call on his name. It's not according to the law. See, Laban, Laban represents the law. Do this, do that. Go here, go there. Let me control you. See, the law represents man trying to do it himself. And we just can't do it. The whole purpose of the law was to show you that you couldn't do it. You cannot do it. Go ahead and read all 613 of those things every day and try and do them. Oh, I got I to gotta, I gotta do this, and I can't do that, and I can't think like that. And, oh, my gosh, I can't do this. Oh, my God. You sit there the whole, just the first ten, just the ten commandments. Just ten. And then after that, 603 more. We don't even know what they are. How many of y'all know the Ten Commandments? Everybody's like, I'm going to put my hand like this. Because don't you dare call me out and test me. That's too much pressure. I'm not going to do it. not going to do it. But now, can you imagine having to memorize 613? And if you mess up on one of them, judgment. And we can kind of laugh at that now. But that was no laughing matter back then. Man, you, you think you got a disrespectful teen now? Well, guess what? Back in the day, you have someone that was rebellious and a disrespectful teenager. Roar youth, y'all listen up. You know what they would do? They say, they take him out to the gate of the city. If you were a kid, you do not want to go to the gate of the city where the elders were. They take you out there, be like, elders, this is my son. He is rebellious and disobedient. And the elders would be like, stone him. And they would literally surround you. They would each pick up a stones. I don't, I don't know how they did this. They just must have had, like, stones at the ready. They'd grab the stones, get around you, be like, sorry, kid, you're rebellious. And they would bombard you with stones until you were dead. You're like, oh, my gosh, that's harsh. That was, that's the law. This is what we've been delivered from. This is why we sing praises to our God. We don't live under that anymore. Thank God. Thank God that we don't have to be under that type of pressure, that type of uh, expectation that we have to be perfect all the time. My goodness, who could live under that? Who could live under that? Well, the whole word is here to show us that nobody could. No one is good. No, not one, the word says. No one was able. Even David, a man after God's own heart, 
He's committing adultery, committing murder, doing census and all this kind of stuff. This is a man after God's own heart. He couldn't even do it. He couldn't do it. So now there's this pressure that Laban is putting on Jacob. Do this. Be this way. Act like that. But you know what, devil? Take you and your flies and go somewhere else. We're trying to be in the word here. So now we've got Laban, who represents the word, trying to lord over. And that's what the law does to people. It tries to lord over you and tries to control you. That's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing when Jesus walked the earth. They were lording over people. Do this. Do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. And Jesus is like, you all ain't even doing it. You all are acting out here. You got all the dress. You got all the fancy stuff going on. You got all these long prayers that you preach in front of everybody. You're giving money in front of everybody and doing all this kind of great stuff. And you're not even doing it. Hypocrites. Brood of vipers. That's as, that's as close as Jesus got to cussing. Brood of vipers. Basically, he's saying, your father is the devil. He, he straight up told people that because they were trying to hold people to a law that they themselves didn't even obey. And here's Laban trying to oppress Jacob, but it didn't matter how much he tried to oppress him because it was freedom, because God had spoken to him. He had given him instruction on what to do, and God decided to bless him through the unlikely, through those spotted, speckled sheep and goats that nobody wanted, that the law would reject because of their imperfections. He says, through this kind, I will bring my blessing. The Lord said in Isaiah 65, he said, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. He's talking about those who didn't even know God, who weren't called according to the house of Israel, the Gentiles, those who were speckled and spotted and streaked. And he said, through this people, I'm going to pour out my spirit. I'm going to strengthen them and I'm going to use them. Raise your hand if you're spotted, streaked, speckled, browned, grayed. The Lord chose you. He chose you. He didn't didn't want those who were without blemish. Jesus was the only one who could do that. He was the only one who was without spot or blemish, and he sacrificed him so that he could bring all those And all your baggage and everything that you've got going on in your life, he died so he could bring you into the family. He said, I lay before you all of me. I reveal myself to you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I lay you myself before you. Look at me. Look at me. And I will produce in your life strength. That's what the sheep did. They kept God. He kept, Jacob kept God before them, and they produced strength. This is God's desire for us. This is his call. It's not about being perfect. It's not about being blameless. It's not about being without spot or blemish. As a matter of fact, those are the ones he wants now. He wants the spotted. He wants the speckled. He wants the ones with blemish on them. Because through that, he gets revealed. He's like, I love the people that don't got it all together. I love that. You know why? Because our transformation brings glory to him. Our transformation brings glory to him. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says, but you shall receive power to be my witnesses here on the earth. To be his witnesses. What is a witness? What is a witness? What do they do? What what comes to mind? Say it. You testify. What what pictures come into your mind when you hear testify? A courtroom. A courtroom. Telling the truth. What else? What's that? Standing before God. Standing before the judge. Right? What other pictures do you get when you hear witness? What's that? There's an accident. Something happened. Something bad happened. And now someone's got to testify. J.D., 
to give a firsthand account. Like, I saw this. Mo. Yeah. Amen. Your life, your life becomes a witness. The, the things that are coming upon you become a witness, right? Think about it. Let me ask you all a question. We are called to witness, be a witness for Christ, correct? Raise your hand if you saw him get crucified. Oh, wait a minute. Time out. Um, Hold on, hold on. We were supposed to be a witness of Christ. We were supposed to testify and tell. All right, raise your hand if you were there when the tumors rolled away and you saw him get up. Uh Uh-oh. We're in trouble now. Okay. Uh, Did anybody see him walk on water? Of course, my daughter raises her hand. All right, did anybody see him feed the 5,000? Travis, you weren't there? You didn't have your camera? Dang, man. All right, all right, all right. Has anybody seen Jesus in the flesh, face to face? I don't mean like a vision. I mean like you saw him, he was like, boom, he walked into the room, and he was right in front of you, and he gave you a high five, and you're like, yeah, man, you got a secret handshake with Jesus. Anybody like that? Hmm. Okay. So... If a witness is supposed to give firsthand account of what they've seen, if we're supposed to tell about something and give witness to something that we have observed, then how on earth could any of us sit in this room and say, I bear witness that Jesus is the Christ? By, by faith. Well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me be an adversary for a minute. By faith? Well, what faith? I've got faith that there's someone sitting on you know, the Great Wall of China right now, get ready to blow it up. I got faith. Does that faith that I have that mean that what I'm seeing in my head is true? The Holy Spirit bears witness of the truth that's in us, but how does that happen? I mean, what, what do we got to stand on here? Well, we stand on the Word. Well, how? But pretend, pretend I don't know God. Pretend that I have, I have nothing in me that wants to know him, what is it that we can possibly bear witness to that would touch my heart, that would possibly qualify for evidence that we can bear witness that Jesus is the Christ, that he died on the cross, that he was raised from the dead, that he lives in heavenly places? How on earth can you possibly say, I am a witness of that when you never saw it except by faith. Hold on. What did you say? Testimony. What is, what is a personal testimony? How we love those around us is a witness. Haven't y'all met some very loving non-Christians? Haven't y'all met some Christians that are so nice? You're like, oh, you must love Jesus. No, I'm an atheist. But I'm just going to. Dang, you just wrecked my whole approach, man. Are you guys like, what is it? You're on the right track. Testimony. You know what it is? It is the transformation that happens in your life that bears witness that Christ is real. That is the witness that we carry. Not that we saw something and we can tell someone. Because we weren't there. The witness that we carry is that I was once lost and now I'm found. I was dead and now I'm alive. I was a heathen and now I'm not. I was a cheater and now I'm not. I was a sinner and now I'm not. I was weak and now I'm strong. I was, I was quiet and now I'm bold. This is the witness. Remember when Peter stood up? Peter, the one who ran away from the little girl who asked him, weren't you with him? He's like, no, girl, I don't know what you're talking about. Three times he denied him. Three times He ran away like a little punk and denied him. What was the the proof that they were even with him? He had become transformed. He was transformed. Because after that day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, 
all of a sudden something came alive inside of Peter. All of a something, all of a sudden something just burst forth in his heart. And he stood up in front of the very people that just murdered his Christ. That little girl that he ran away from was probably standing right there in the midst of all of it. In front of all these people, he said, hear me. This Jesus whom you crucified is the Christ. And he spoke boldly under the power of the Holy Spirit. And it cut them to the heart. And he wasn't sitting there trying to convince people. Oh, you got to come over here. You got to do this. You got to do that. They cried out themselves, what must I do to be saved? something had transformed in Peter. There was a transformation that occurred inside of him. And people looked at him and said, there is something about this guy. Remember in Acts chapter 4, when they went before the Sanhedrin because they were preaching Christ and they threatened them? And then they preached Christ to them. And they said, when they saw the boldness of Peter... And that these were untrained men. They knew that they had been with Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit released in our life gives us transforming power that allows us to bear witness that Jesus is real. It comes with the revelation that Jesus is Christ. Revelation comes from God. You can't conjure that up yourself. All you can do is prepare your heart and say, yes, Lord, whatever you tell me. That's what I want to hear. I'm not going to try and defend my position. I'm not going to try and create another God that sits comfortably with my life and where I am. I give you full access to come in and wreck my life. You wreck my life for good. I hold nothing back from you. And then your heart is ready for the revelation of Christ. We have a lot of people that are walking around without the revelation of Christ because they haven't prepared their heart for him to come in and do what he wants. We, we've taken an approach. I will... I will allow you to come in so long as you don't mess with this area. We see that in chapter 31 in Genesis. As they're going through, you know, the, the rest of the story is, is you know, Laban, the Lord told, uh, tells Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, Jacob, to run and, and leave Laban. Take all of his family, all, of the, all of the, uh, the flocks that he's gathered. He said, take his family and go. And then Laban finds out about it, and he overtakes him. And he's like, I, I could do you harm right now, but I'm not. I'm not going to do it. Because I had a dream, and God warned me not to. He warned me not even to threaten you. But why did you take my, my children from me? He said, because I was afraid you were going to try and keep them by force. I thought you were going to try and keep them by force. That's what the law does. It tries to keep you by force. No, there is freedom in Christ. Not freedom to do whatever we want. But there's freedom and there's grace to do whatever he wants. Because our hearts become aligned with him and he is what we want he is our exceedingly great reward that's what he that becomes what we want so there's a freedom in him but the law tries to restrict so joseph says look i served you for 20 years with everything that i had you changed my wages on me 10 times you tried to manipulate me you tried to control me you tried to use me but the lord released me he said so i'm going to set up this pillar here as a witness between us, that you go your way, and we're going to go this way because the Lord's told us to. And there's this, this separation between, between them. And the Lord took the speckled, the spotted, and moved on to do everything that God had called him to do and left the law behind. We can leave the law behind. There's no strength in the law. There's no power in the law. There's, there's none of that left in it. But there's freedom in Christ. There's freedom and liberty in him, and there's power in him. If we will allow him to come in and wreck us and hold nothing back from him and say, Lord, whatever you want to do, that's what I want to. I release it. I release it. And just put your, your, your faith and your trust in him. Simple, but not easy. And he's, and he's looking for those who aren't perfect because you know it. And when you know you're not perfect, God can do something with that. He wants a broken and contrite spirit. When you know you've messed up, 
God says, I can do something with that. That's what, that's what David was. David did all that stuff. He messed up all the time. But God said, I can do something with that because at least you acknowledge it. At least you know you messed up. I can work with that. But Saul, he said, but I was just, and I was gone. Well, what had happened was, is there was this, well, you're not going to believe this. And then, no, 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 no. Just say I messed up. And let's work. That, that I can do something with. That I can do something with. That was something that was in Jacob. Even though he was a deceiver, he was willing to say, okay, this is my bad. And we're going to see that in the next chapter. We're going to see his confrontation with the Lord. He gets a revelation, and then he gets a confrontation with God. See, it's not just over once you, once you get to know him. Then there's a time of confrontation. This is where we get to really see who we are when we come face to face with our God. But let me ask you this. Are you ready? Are you ready to say, Lord, take everything. I hold nothing back. Are you ready to say, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hide anything from you? Oh, see, that's what I was getting to. I totally, you know, I'll start talking and I'll totally lose my train of thought. But praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit brings it right back. Glory to God. See, now what happened was, what happened was his wife, Rachel, in the midst of all this, Laban accused them of stealing from him. And Jacob said, if you find anything of yours amongst my stuff, then you go ahead and kill whoever's holding on to it. So he went through and searched and everything. And what happened was Rachel stole the idols of the house. She took her father's gods. Because remember, this is a, this is a pagan society that there, she was a part of. She took all the household idols, put them in her saddle, and then when her dad came looking, she put them underneath the saddle and sat on it. And then her dad walked in and said, oh, forgive me, father. I can't get up. It's that time of the month. <laughs> and lied. And lied. She wanted to hold on to a little part, just a little bit. I just need a little bit of safety. I just need a little bit of these idols. I mean, it was, it was there for me for so long. Whenever I needed something and I was trusting in you and it was just a little too hard, I would go over to them. And it was cool because it was a face looking back at me. It was a little carved midget looking thing, but it was, it was a face. It was something to look at. It was, made, it was made with our own hands, carved, made of wood, but at least it was something to look at. And she held on to it and brought that with her. We can't bring anything with us. We got to leave it all behind. It takes a process. Sometimes, and, and the Lord knows that, sometimes we, it takes some time to leave those things behind. It takes a little bit of time to put those things aside, you know. And, and that's okay. It's okay for it to take some time. God understands, and he knows that we're growing. He doesn't expect you to be there. He just expects you to be willing to progress with him, for, willing for him to show you some things. But Rachel held on to that and invited that into the camp. So are you ready to let some things go today? Are you ready to, ready to let some of those idols that you've, you've kept around for just a little bit, take them out from the saddle and throw them outside and be like, okay, God, I'm going to trust you 100%. I'm going to trust you with everything I got. No more trying to do it on my own. No more trying to live under the law. I just want what you want. I just want what you want. And that's my challenge to you today. If you don't know Jesus, if you haven't put those things down, and you're ready to do that, we can do it right now, today. No guilt, no shame. No condemnation, nothing like that. We have all messed up. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is good. No, not one. So anybody that's pretending like they're all that, they're the ones that probably got the most to hide. They got the most to hide. So don't worry about, well, everybody's going to know my stuff. Guess what? Everybody knows you got stuff anyway. Plus, they're not even thinking about you because they're worrying about their own stuff. As a matter of fact, if you would be willing to step out, then I bet you those other people that got stuff too, they'd be encouraged to step out themselves. 
That's what it's about. Bob is calling people out. <laughs> if you want to do that, you want to lay it down, cast that stuff at Jesus' feet, and take on his Holy Spirit that transforms you and gives you the power to be a witness. The power to go out and let people know not what Jesus did, but who he is by how he lives in you. Then let's do